And so today, our Health Leads Network Forum, How Social Need Programs Are Shifting During the Pandemic Due to Increased Demand for Essential Resources, is going to focus on social needs teams and workflows. And in particular, we're really going to hone in on workforces today. So my name is Megan Pazaki. I am a director on the communications team here at Health Leads. And I will be facil facilitating our call with my colleague, Keely Quinn, who is the Vice President of Program Services here at HealthLeads. And we're really excited to have this discussion today with you. But before we begin, my colleague Ola is going to review some helpful housekeeping information. Oh, Ola, I think if you're talking, you might be on mute still. Okay, well, while Ola, um, her audio may not be working right now, but I can certainly step in. So, take a second to make sure you have the following panels open, um, the participant panel and the chat panel. If you see in this image, you'll see there's a little chat bubble and a participant panel bubble, which is a little human with some lines. That will enable you to um, be able to chat and take yourself off of mute when um, we begin our discussion today. If you have any um, audio connection um, issues, uh, you can call in the number um, that will pop up when you uh, click the audio button. The chat function on the bottom right hand side of the screen um, allows you to communicate with all of the attendees and the panelists. If you experience any technical issues, please private message the Learning Network and they'll be able to help uh, sort you out. To raise your hand, which will help you come off of mute and so that we can uh, bring you into the discussion, simply click the hand icon on the bottom right hand side of the screen. You can send all your questions today through the chat function to all participants. If you wish to come off of mute, again, click that uh, speaker button and raise your hand and uh, we'll be able to bring you into the conversation. And so just a reminder, the webinar is being recorded and will be shared afterwards. So for those who may not be familiar with Health Leads, Health Leads is an innovation hub that runs both national and local initiatives that address the deep societal roots of racial inequity that impact our health. And so as black and brown communities are disproportionately impacted by COVID because of structural racism, here at Health Leads, we're focused on both helping communities respond to immediate essential health resource needs and rebuild equitable systems for the future. And so our Health Leads COVID work is really focused on four core areas. The first is building community-owned crisis resilient tech infrastructure. The second is connecting people to essential resources using displaced workers who need an income. The third is creating community-owned data to identify gaps, enable local collaboration, and rebuild national and local systems. And the fourth is sharing learnings and connecting folks so that they can learn from one another, which is why we're all here today. And so with that in mind, we had reached out to our Health Leads Network, our partners, a lot of you on this call, and we asked what would be most useful during the COVID-19 crisis. A lot of the responses we had were all about how are others adapting their social needs program? How are, what are the strategies that are supporting the most vulnerable populations right now? What are others doing to navigate this current resource availability um, when we're seeing such an unprecedented demand? And so taking all of your responses, we um, really wanted to, um, you know, create a space, an intentional space where you can support each other by sharing these promising practices, resources, and learnings that will help you meaningfully and equitably adapt your social needs programs while we're all trying to quickly adjust to this new normal of COVID-19. And so with that in mind, we really hone in during the Health Leads Network Forum series on the primary drivers of social needs integration. And so like I mentioned before, our focus today is social needs team and workflow and really focusing in on workforces. And so COVID-19 has forced many organizations to adapt in so many ways. 
And especially in this forum series, we've spent a lot of time so far talking about the adaptations in screening and resource referral processes, transitioning um, in-person interactions to telehealth practices. And today we're really going to think about and focus on how those adaptations have impacted workforces and uh, what organizations have had to keep in mind while those adaptations are being implemented. And, you know, as we all know, there's so many aspects to consider. And especially when we think about, you know, creating either a new workforce or even adjusting an existing one is no easy task and comes with a bunch of challenges and barriers. And so, you know, something we've seen at Health Leads is, you know, organizations are trying to find a lot of, you know, creative ways to build and expand upon their workforces. And, you know, we've seen some leverage college student volunteers, some are working with AmeriCorps programs and rehiring former staff and even redeploying current staff to help meet the resource needs of the community. And so that brings us to our objective today. So when we think about all of these changes that have been happening, we really want to discuss how COVID-19 has impacted your social needs workforce. And we want to create a space for dialogue to share what's been working in your community and what hasn't. And the most important part is we really want each other to engage and learn from uh, one another. And I know it often feels like there's not a lot of hope on the horizon and, you know, we're all just trying to respond and help our communities the best we can. But coming together in a space like this to brainstorm and and share and learn from each other helps generate that hope and helps mobilize improvements in communities across the country. And so throughout our conversation today, it's important to remember that even just defining any of these problems you're facing is a huge step forward. And being able to share with each other any small insights or best practices against these barriers really matters and can help make a difference in someone else's community. So I really encourage you to come off of mute today, use the chat box, share what's happening in your community, um, and really uh, just help one another out. And uh, just to frame out how our discussion is going to go, we will have a series of questions that use our poll feature, um, and then we will uh, discuss the poll answers and uh, questions in a bit more detail. And so you'll see the polls pop up in the bottom right-hand side of your screen, and so we ask that you just make sure to take the time to fill those out. Um, and then the one last thing I want to point out is when you do come off of mute, please say your name and organization um, so we know where you're calling in from. So with that in mind, I think we're ready to kick off our conversation today. And so our first question that will be popping up on the right hand side of your screen very shortly is what factors influence your decision to redeploy staff? And so is it the needs of the community, the current resource landscape? needs of community partners, current in-person clinic volume, internal staff skill sets, maybe you haven't had to redeploy any staff, um, or maybe there's some other factors that are influencing um, your decision to redeploy staff. And so something that, um, you know, redeployment, we've been seeing a lot of organizations try to come up with some creative solutions to redeploy their staff right now to help their communities. And so, um, you know, we have about 30 seconds left on the poll, so make sure to answer what factors uh, have really influenced your decision uh, to redeploy staff. And then we'll dive into this a little bit more. Okay, we've got about five seconds left, and then we'll see our results pop up on the screen very shortly. And we'll see what everyone um, is thinking on this. Okay, so what factors have influenced your decision to redeploy staff? So three, we've got 25% saying the needs of the community. Um, we've had 33% who haven't had to redeploy any staff. We're looking at, again, 25% with current in-person clinic volume. And so that is really interesting. And so I am curious, like, when we, um, for those who have had to redeploy staff, I'd love to um, have you, you know, either chat in, and for those who haven't had to redeploy staff, maybe why you haven't had to. Um, but I would love to really kick off this discussion for those who had had to redeploy staff. Something that we've been seeing a lot of at Health Leads is, um, you know, the factors that you need to consider. And so, 
um, oh, if you want to go to the next slide, we've seen a lot of things um, and factors to consider when you are redeploying staff. And so I know, uh, Keely, you guys have been working on our program team a lot um, with external organizations on how you're um, they're restructuring and redeploying staff. So I'd love um, for you to kind of just kick off this discussion um, with some of the things that organizations have really focused in on um, with redeployment. And again, in this time, I'd really encourage people to um, share in about uh, their, their experiences either redeploying staff um, or not. Thanks, Megan. Um, so I want to share an example um, that has brought us some learning in terms of, um, you know, partnering and, and redeploying staff. We've done um, a number of, of, of training and, and coaching along these lines um, with uh, various partners around the country. Um, but we're working with uh, one partner in particular that is an education-based nonprofit, and they're helping us um, do outreach to community members to connect um, community members to resource needs. And so they had um, a team of AmeriCorps members that um, they needed to provide some sort of work with, and, and we came up with a plan to do this redeployment. And so, you know, arranged a training and workflow. And, and there were a couple of surprises that came up when we were developing this. Um, and, and one of them is probably unique to this particular um, redeployment. So. Um, as I mentioned, it's an education-based nonprofit. So there are AmeriCorps members. We're used to working with um, children in the school. So actually language skills was not something that they normally had to consider. Um, most of their work happened in English within the schools. Um, but doing outreach to the families, um, the need for bilingual staff um, was, was important. And, and this was a challenge that um, we, we hadn't necessarily anticipated we would um, have a problem with. So it's fortunately an easy one to resolve in terms of um, one is, you know, distributing cases according to language and the other is using interpretive services. Um, but I think the other learning we had was around uh, anxiety and stress. So um, while the the staff at the nonprofit felt that their members were um, well positioned to do this type of outreach. Um, when it actually came to setting up the training and doing the work, um, there was a lot of feedback from the redeployed workforce um, that they had anxiety about this new set of roles and responsibilities. And so we really had to make space to, to discuss those concerns. Um, you know, follow up with them post training to see what they still had concerns about, and then really ensure that we had adequate coaching and support processes in place. So, um, doing some extra coaching, um, checking in uh, on how they were processing, and really making sure that we were um, including self care um, as part of our weekly check ins. So, those are just a couple examples of, of what we learned in, in doing some uh, redeployment with this particular apartment, uh, partner. I'm curious um, if others um, have, have had either learnings or, or things that they've used off of this list or, or other things they would add to this list when considering redeploying staff. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. So again, if anyone, um, uh, want to come off of mute, just raise your hand and we'll be sure to bring you into the conversation or chat into the chat box if you're unable to come off of mute. Um, we'd love to hear from you um, and get your reaction to some of this. And so, Keely, I know one of the things you mentioned um, was especially around, you know, that need for bilingual staff, something that I think, you know, we've been hearing a lot of is you know, especially switching to um, like telehealth practices, even more just like within like screening and referrals is around that interpreter piece. And so I know that was one of the solutions and I know people have had, um, uh, and I'm just curious, because I know we've heard a lot about um, either the difficulties of arranging the interpretive services. And so I'm wondering part of that within part of your project there, um, how it was like working with interpreter services. Because I know that's been, um, there's been a few barriers around um, getting access and making sure that there's a scheduled time um, to reach out to community members with each other. 
Right. I think I'm I'm guessing for for um, people in health systems, this is is less of a, a hurdle um, or obstacle. Um, I think the the biggest thing is if you're working with staff that have never used interpreters before and and helping them understand what that um, sort of pattern and rhythm looks like um, and sort of those those best practices. Um, I think it also plays out when you're used to working with people in person and that, um, was there a question or did somebody want to add something? Okay. Um, I think the other thing is just, you know, changing over from um, working in person to virtually. And so, you know, with an interpreter service, um, I think one of the biggest things is, is learning how to, um, that you need to speak directly to the client. You're not asking the interpreter and saying, you know, can you ask for their date of birth? You talk to the client as you normally would and then make space for the interpreter. Megan, does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. It does. Thank you. Um, oh, does. Is someone trying to come off of you? We'd love to bring you into the discussion if you are. Um, just let us know and we will um, chat with you. Okay. Um, again, I really just, if, um, really encourage you to submit any of your ob observations, questions. Um, again, what factors on this list have you already been considering or what um, What's missing? Are there other factors that you think are really important that um, aren't part of this list? We'd love to hear from you. And so um, I know one of the other things that you didn't really, um, in that example, have a chance to go into, but I'd love to dive a little bit more into how can you leverage um, some of your staff's existing strengths as you think about redeployment. Sorry, no, Megan, is Keely, that to the oh, no. group? Oh, well, it was to the group, but um, if anyone has any insights on that, or Keely, I don't know if you or any of the Health Aids colleagues on the line um, have any insights on how they've been able to leverage uh, their staff's existing strengths to help uh, during this time. I'd love to hear of if others have examples and, and I think my question to you all who've had to redeploy staff is, you know, where does leveraging their strength come into that decision? Um, is, it, is it a driving force or is it something that you know you're redeploying this workforce and then you start thinking about the strengths that they might bring to this? Yeah, that's a great question, Keely. And so, again, if anyone on the line has um, been thinking through this, please, you know, chat in the chat box, come off of mute. We'd love to hear um, what you think and how you've been thinking through that and the processes uh, around that. And so we can give another minute or so um, on this topic. And so, again, if anyone um, has any other factors that they think um, have been important or haven't been important when you're looking at redeploying any of your staff, um, please chime in now. Otherwise, we can uh, start moving into our next question in, a, um, in about a few seconds or so. Hi, this is Michelle. Um, I would just want to highlight uh, communication skills being, you know, something that is probably really critical in the role that um, staff was playing prior to COVID and um, just reinforcing how those skills transfer in a virtual setting and um, using different techniques like empathic inquiry and, and motivational interviewing techniques in terms of working with patients things that 
skills that they have used before can easily be used in various uh, redeployment and um, in so many situations. So communication skills, reinforcing that, doing a refresher on communication skills, I think is, is key. And I, I know we're going to talk about that a little bit more in the um, when we talk about training. Thanks, Michelle. Um, oh, and I see, um, I've, yeah, I, compl I love that, that communication skill is um, so crucial, and um, I'm excited to dive into that in the, the next section, but I do see that Brittany is um, having a difficult time with mute. You should be unmuted now, Brittany. Um, can, you, can you hear us, or can you speak? I can hear you. Can anyone hear me? We can. Welcome. Oh, great. That's awesome. Um, we have some of the ways that we've redeployed staff. I'm sorry, I feel like I'm going to backtrack a little bit and then catch up to the current question. Um, a lot of these factors are are very near and dear to us. We have um, we currently screen folks for health related social needs or social determinants of health within our healthcare organizations in town. So patients will receive screenings and then our organization navigates them within those services. So we have had to redeploy um, ourselves and those other organizations as well. We are now receiving lists of patients to call that would have been scheduled within that time period to make sure that people are still receiving navigation services. And we, um, we recently, or we previously had um, a limitation on who could receive navigation services from us at our organization. We previously only um, served some Medicaid plans, and now we have opened up to anyone with any health coverage in our community may receive some resource navigation from us. Um, and we've also had to deploy a few staff members to connect with our local 211 on a daily basis to understand what what organizations are changing their services, service hours, et cetera, during this time period. There have been a lot of um, patients or clients that have come to us that have mentioned that they don't know what organizations are open. And then the concern is that a lot of organizations are telling us that they don't know why community members are feeling that way. So we've definitely tried to help out in, in spreading the word because we're not sure why these organizations are perceived as closed. Um, some other things that we've considered are we give a wellness time off, like an hour where people can make a phone call, do some exercise during their work week and we pay them for one hour of that time to address the stress that happens from adjusting to a new schedule. There are also a lot of folks who have reduced their hours because of childcare needs or because of a difficult situation for them. And we still make sure that we're paying them, um, I think it's 50 or 75% of the amount that they would normally receive anyway, just to make sure that we're um, helping people financially. Um, and I think that, oh, another thing that we've done is we have partnered with our local health department to interpret the videos that they're putting out for the public to Spanish. Previously, they didn't have anyone who spoke Spanish that was able to do these interpretations. So really making sure that we're still being connected to the community and looking at gaps where there um, are equity considerations. Thanks, Brittany. And can you just remind us what um, organization you're uh, with? Yeah, sorry, you did ask that. I'm with HealthNet of West Michigan. Okay, great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, and um, I think something that really stuck out for me in that was redeploying staff and working with uh, 211. Um, I know something that of, we've heard a lot of, especially in these forum series, is the importance of like kind of transforming into that like spreader of truth and being able to keep the community updated. And so I'd love to hear a little bit more about what does that relationship look like with 211 and um, how have you guys, uh, like are you, are your staff like deployed in the 211 offices right now? How are you working um, with your local 211 to make sure that people um, have that updated resource availability list? I believe what it is is that so we work with two on one already to, as our um, as our basis for the resources that we provide out to our community members. 
So I believe what is happening right now is actually we just have three staff members who rotate and calling them daily to get updates on any organizations. So I think that two on one is just giving us their particular information of what they know has been updated rather than going through every organization one by one. Um, and we also work with the local food and nutrition coalition who will provide us updates about those organizations as well. That's really helpful. And are you guys, how are you sharing that information? Do you, I know a lot of people have been doing shared like Google Docs or shared, um, you know, Google spreadsheets or Excel spreadsheets. Um, how are you guys keeping all of that? Um, like, what are you using a specific platform to keep that information um, flowing? Yeah, it's just an internal Excel document that our team has open pretty much all the time. They will check it before calling a community member to provide that up that resource just to make sure that the information they're giving is updated. So just a simple Excel spreadsheet. Okay, cool. And so my last, if you don't mind, I have one more follow-up question for you. Yeah. Again, and if anyone on the line um, also has any uh, questions of Brittany, please feel free to type them in. Um, but I'm curious also of like, I know you said that your organization really um, is that resource navigation component. And so have you had to, with a big switch to telehealth, um, I'm wondering if that's also changed any of your, um, you know, uh, navigation processes or practices and how you've had to adapt with your workforce on that. Yeah, so our organization doesn't directly use telehealth, the organizations that we partner with do. So we are, um, like I mentioned at the beginning, we, we screen the community members for needs that they have. So typically food, housing, transportation, et cetera. Normally what was happening is that when patients would check in to a medical appointment, either with primary care or behavioral health, or they would attend the emergency department, they would receive a screening that would ask them questions about those needs. So now that a lot of offices have been closed, um, and additionally, a lot of our emergency departments have reduced staff members just to keep social distancing. So therefore, the amount of work has increased for them a little bit and no one's able to hand those screenings out. What we have, we received like a post-emergency department list for our emergency department sites that lets us know who came in that day. And then we will actually call those community members ourselves and read through the screening with them. And then after reading through, which is something what we would have normally done in the office, that's when we provide the resource navigation services. Thanks for clarifying that. And I've heard um, from other orgs that having that post CD list um, has been quite helpful in a time when a lot of people aren't coming in for their appointments. So thank you so much for um, sharing all that information about your program. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so if anyone has any other questions or thoughts on this topic, um, in your last few seconds to chat them in or come off of mute, and if not, we can start moving to our next question. Okay, and so the next question is, and I know not everyone on the line has had to necessarily um, redeploy their workforce, but you know, you may have to create some new trainings. And so you're going to see on the right hand bottom corner of your screen, a poll pop up and ask you, have you created new trainings to account for workforce redeployment in response to COVID-19? And so, you know, as we've kind of, you know, mentioned in the previous question, you know, there's a lot of switching to that virtual setting um, is, you know, a challenge on many levels, but when you think about what does that mean um, to train people with either if they're in new roles or new um, working in different tasks now, what does that look like? And how can you make sure that you're creating um, some trainings that are really beneficial um, when there's a lot of um, new barriers around virtual settings? And so you have about 10 seconds left to answer this poll question. Again, it's in the right-hand bottom of your corner. Um, and so you can either agree or disagree that you've had to create any kind of new training right now during COVID, um, especially around um, this virtual setting that we are um, mostly loving in these days. Okay, 
Let's see what our responses are. They should pop up any second now. A moment of truth. Okay, so we've had um, a good chunk of the members on this call right now, 73% have had to create um, some new training uh, to account for either workforce development, redeployment, or even just some uh, virtual setting um, training in response to COVID-19. And so thank you for filling that out. And again, that's something that at HealthAids we've seen a lot of, and I know that uh, some of my colleagues on the call have really um, spent a lot of time thinking through the best way to create trainings and, um, you know, how do you think through that when, you know, typically everyone's so used to in-person, what does that look like virtually and being mindful of all the barriers. And so, um, you know, Keely or Michelle, I would love for you to share some um, highlights. Again, this is a very big list of factors to consider when you're designing trainings, um, but I'd love for you guys to uh, share your experience here, and then I would love for others on the line to chat in whether or not you guys um, have, you know, the factors you're considering while you've been creating some trainings right now. Michelle, are you on the line, or would you like me to step in? I'm here, sorry, can you re repeat that? Yeah, no, so I would Question? love, um, Michelle, I know you've been doing a lot of um, work and thinking around how do you design trainings, especially in this virtual space. And so um, when you're looking at uh, what are, you know, what are some of the factors that you guys have been thinking through when you're designing trainings uh, for redeployed workforces? Yeah, definitely um, there are some considerations in terms of how to adapt the trainings to a virtual setting. Uh, we really want to consider the size of the group that we have and the amount of time we're hosting virtual settings. So whereas an in-person training could be, you know, two or three hours, we really, that's challenging in a virtual setting. Um, we, we do want to try to make the um, trainings interactive when possible. We are doing a live session with participants, make it engaging for them to be able to have some time to practice the skills that we're discussing, do some role playing, um, ask questions, talk about their own um, experiences and bring their expertise into training so that it's not just um, you know, people being talked at for two hours. That's not a really effective way of, of engagement. Um, so yeah, those are some of the things we're considering. Um, again, the, the competencies that are needed, the skills, um, and, and how to apply those into a um, engagement with patients virtually and what that looks like. Um, so yeah, and, and there are also things that, you know, you can really maximize the time that you do have together if you're doing a live training by providing some um, pre-training materials or, or post-training uh, follow-up work that people can can do um, to practice those skills, continue the conversation with their colleagues, and um, provide check-ins, you know, follow trainings if needed. Thanks so much for sharing that. And so I'd love, you know, to hear from someone on the line if, um, you know, if any of these resonate um, with them when they've been thinking through and um, delivering trainings right now with their staff or if any people have experienced anything different. Um, please, you know, if you want to come off of mute, please raise your hand. Um, we'll make sure um, between me and my colleague Ola, we'll make sure that we can get you off mute. Otherwise, please use the chat box and chat in anything um, that you either want to dive in a little bit further on with this topic or what you're experiencing in your community. And so, yeah, thank you, Michelle. And so, I'm wondering, especially, I know um, you mentioned, you know, when you're switching to virtual, the importance of keeping those trainings, you know, interactive and engaging and having those role-playing activities, and then how they, um, you know, then how staff can apply that um, when they're working with patients on the phone. And so I'm wondering if there's any other, you know, tips or tricks, especially around that engagement and interactivity piece, are you, um, like that you're using in the polls that has worked well, or maybe some things that haven't worked well that you've had to adapt, like 
um, I don't know, if you're like doing any polls or any kind of activities, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. You mean the, the pre and post uh, the training assessments? Um, or just in like the trainings in general, like um, mm -hmm. how are you, if there's like any specific activities you're doing to really keep that engagement level and interactivity piece um, high during the training while people are um, working on a computer screen. Yeah, oh, and one, yeah, one thing I will also mention is, you know, starting out with some community agreements about um, being present during the training and just, you know, acknowledging and recognizing that um, we're in a virtual space and it is very easily, <laughs> easy to get distracted and to be multitasking and checking email and doing other things. But, um, you know, keeping engaged with the content is really important and getting participation and um, asking questions. That's why, you know, if you are doing a live session, you really want to make sure people are taking that time to ask questions and get clarification on their roles and responsibilities or any of the skills that they're learning. So um, encouraging folks to have their cameras on and, you know, so that you can have somewhat of a personal interaction um, using um, kind of icebreaker questions and things that you would normally do maybe in an in-person in training to get to know the group. If that's something that, you know, if you have a group that hasn't really worked together before, um, just talking about the strengths of the team is another way to, to get people together. I know in some um, other trainings we are using, we are using some different polling features um, such as um, Mentimeter, which allows you to do a word cloud. So um, participants can type in a word and then it will create a word cloud um, out of that and that can be shared with the group. Um, you can do different kinds of polling features, definitely, or using the chat function. Um, but most important, I think, is to have people, you know, it, and participate verbally and to be present on the screen and, and be present within the training um, for the duration of the time, if possible. Yeah, thanks for diving into that a little bit more. And um, that polling feature that creates the word cloud, what was that called again? It's uh, Mentimeter, I think is, let me get the spelling for you, but it's um, a free, there is a um, free version that can be used. Um, it's M-E-N-T-I-M-E-T-E-R. Um, there's a website and it's, it's very easy to use. You chat a link to the participants. They can, it can be accessed via phone. And so um, you, you can also use like emojis and different kinds of quest polling questions in that. Um, they have some different features. Like I, I really like the word cloud feature. Um, it's great, for like a pre-training, like in the beginning of a training, to see if um, people feel their skills or abilities have changed at the end of the training. To kind of do a comparison of the word clouds is nice. Um, so yeah, there's a free website. There's also like Poll Everywhere, which I think might have a free version as well. Or if you're just in Zoom or WebEx, there's polling features within that too. If you don't want to use like an outside um, resource, but lots of ways to, to gauge, you know, people's um, thoughts and feelings on topics as you're doing trainings. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. There's a lot of, it sounds like there's a lot of good tools out there. And I really like how um, through those features, especially the word cloud, that sounds really fun. Um, being able to, you know, as a participant, see, like, see the input that you're giving in a lot of times um, when you're, you know, doing polls and not being able to see that immediate impact. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's fun to then be able to, you know, compare. And again, another way to really keep um, the attendees engaged and see um, yeah. any comparisons from the beginning to the end. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, and just one other last thing I'll add is um, from the feedback that we have received from trainings that we've done um, virtually, um, and a lot of this content is was content that we had previously um, facilitated in person and, and acknowledging that, that we, you know, have adapted it to um, a virtual setting it was important to get feedback from the training participants on what worked well and what might be improved. And, the, um, you know, people really enjoy the ability to practice the skills that they're learning and do some role playing or just see modeling of how the, um, you know, what they're learning, seeing it in action. So that definitely was feedback to, to always, try to include that element. And if there's 
more time that can be dedicated to those elements, that, that seems to be the most um, useful part of, of training for folks. Yeah, I think that's a great thing to add, and especially thinking back to what Kiwi had mentioned earlier in the call about the exam anxiety and stress that some people feel, especially when they're redeployed in a new role, that opportunity to role play and really um, feel comfortable in that um, is fantastic. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And so um, I see um, Megan's also chatted in to everyone, you should be able to work with Epic EMR to get um, the uh, emergency or yeah. EMR, the uh, electronic medical record to get social determinants of health translated if you have not tried already. Um, and that's another um, great tip. Thank you, Megan. I don't know if there's any, um, if you want to expand on that, you're welcome to come off of mute. Um, uh, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how um, that works. If not, oh, oh, Megan? Oh, is someone? I think I hear. Oh, I can. I can. Is this Megan? Yes. Hi. Welcome. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more how you use Epic um, in this way. Um. Well, I. I mean, I. We haven't had ours translated. Um. But you know, the social determinants of health. We do have that available for. Um, our population. And uh, we've played with it a little bit, but, um, you know, it, ours just went live um, not too long ago, and then all of the COVID, you know, came about. And so we've, we actually, our, um, our program, which was the care coordination program, actually turned into the COVID monitoring team. So um, we started actually um, following COVID results. So um, our program turned into a little bit different program. And so the social determinants of health kind of got put on a, um, like back burner for a little while until we start you know, going back to our care coordination program. So, but I know that working with your um, EMR, like through Epic, you know, they, they can you know, tweak things, you know, in Epic for you to um, actually turn on different settings and everything like that. So, we had to completely structure, <clears throat> structure our uh, program, so they had to build our program. Um, templates and everything like that in Epic for us. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah. oh, oh, uh, sorry, I think there's a little background there. Um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. And that's interesting um, how um, your program was able to uh, react, especially switching into that COVID monitoring team. Um, and yeah, and I think that's a great tip for everyone uh, to keep in mind too, is to think about your electronic medical record for sure. Um, but I know we do have 15 minutes left in the call, so I do wanna move us on to our last um, question on this topic. Um, so thank you again, Megan. Um, question three, I have had to provide additional team support because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so, you know, when we think about, um, you know, either redeploying staff, rehiring staff, people, you know, switching their teams um, into different functions right now, you know, it's a, it's a hard time uh, to be working in this space for so many reasons. And so when we think about how we're providing additional, any additional team support, what does that look like? And um, so here we're just seeing like, have you, had to within your organization provide any additional team support during COVID um, as your staff and fellow colleagues are either, you know, changing, you know, their roles a bit or even just adapting to this, um, this COVID-19 um, pandemic work style. And so you have about 20 seconds left. The poll is in the bottom right hand of the corner. Um, so please take the time uh, to answer and we should have our results in a few seconds and then we'll 
dive into um, this management aspect um, and support a little bit deeper. And so unsurprisingly, 100% um, of the people who've taken the poll agree that they have had to provide additional team support because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so what does that look like? And so I would love to hear um, in the chat if people, you know, start putting in some ways that um, you've had to um, provide more team support. And so I know that's something that at Health Leads we've been working with partners on too. And um, again, here's a list of some of the things we've seen. And I love, um, you know, Keely, I know this is again, um, part of the work you've been working on. I'd love to hear a little bit more about some of the helpful practices or techniques that you've noticed um, to support uh, employees. Sure, thanks, Megan. Um, I have to say, having seen the, the poll results, I, I feel um, reassured I'm in good company because I think we've all had then similar experiences in terms of, you know, these are practices and techniques that, you know, would happen regardless of, of whether there was a pandemic going on or not. But I think some of them have become even um, even more important or, or more um, of a manager's um, take up more of a manager's time because of the situation. And so I know I've found um, a lot of um, great ideas from just what seem like very simple fixes that I've heard from, from other partners, from other colleagues on, on what they're doing to, um, you know, to provide this type of um, management oversight and support. And I think, you know, the ones that are, are really um, rise to the surface, particularly if you have a redeployed workforce, is you know that management and, and support of the team, um, the the um, flexibility um, and self care, um, and then I've also um, had some really interesting bright spots around professional development. Um, I think in terms of um, management and self care, one example that I I thought was just it was very simple, but it was it paid off really well is. Um, one system I know, um, their care coordinators, they do um, a daily morning huddle and they use that time to check in on, um, you know, what are those updated resources that they need. Um, but it's also been a way, because the care team has had to transition to working virtually, it's been a way for the manager to get sort of a sense of where people are, um, hear their voices, um, sort of you know, catalog, engage, are there people she needs to, to check in or provide more support offline? And they're able to do some sort of, um, you know, light sort of case management conversations around where they're finding barriers or the group helping troubleshoot an issue. Um, and so this person does this, you know, daily. It's like a 20-minute call. Um, so I think that's been great. Um, I'm going to pause for a second because I think, um, Brittany, you bring up, um, a really good point. So, Megan, I'll step back to make space. Absolutely. And, um, Brittany, I'll read your point out in case anyone um, can't see. Some staff need assistance with re-motivation, need to accommodate to learning preferences, more follow-up to keep folks on task, adding self-care opportunities, doing more research on strategies that benefit the whole organization with a focus on equity, particularly on social determinants of health during COVID and doing raffles to help promote fun. Um, Brittany, I don't know if you if you feel comfortable coming off of mute again, um, but would love to hear a little bit more about that, um, if possible. If not, um, would love to hear others' reactions as well. Um, yeah, so, I do come you know, off mute. Great. Yeah. Um, so I guess in, in terms of of motivation that I'm finding that a lot of folks have a hard time, I guess just really not being in person with everyone else and having the opportunity to ask questions really immediately or just knowing that you can lean over to somebody else's desk and ask a question. So something that I've had to do with a lot of staff is just to set up a work session and work through things, you know, just really to talk through issues together rather than just asking someone to complete something via email or asking someone to review a document and send it back to me. I think a lot of people are missing that personal connection and um, really just they're losing motivation by sitting in, you know, at home all day kind of staring at this at their computer. Um, 
And in terms of learning preferences, I think that ties in a little bit too. I think a lot of people are kinesthetic learner, learners or very hands-on. So the fact that we're doing so much um, reading and listening isn't really conducive for all types of learning or it doesn't work as just that particular method. So I feel like that ties into meeting more in person too, is really trying to keep, as being hands-on, just trying to interact with your coworkers because we also can't go to our community partners either. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Brittany. Um, and especially your part about the, um, how different it is to not be able to just go to your colleague's desk and ask that question. Like, I'm certainly missing that as well. And so I love that you've created this virtual work session to try to, you know, mimic that um, ability to um, ask those little questions and work through those problems um, as a group and that group think. And so, um, yeah, and I know I see Megan on here agreeing that personal connection and that face-to-face -face meeting time for as much as we all are like, oh, another meeting, it's, it's tough. It's, um, it's a tough time. And um, I certainly miss that as well. And so um, thanks for sharing all of that and a good point about learning styles too. It's, it's hard and it's important to remember to, you know, as much as we possibly can try to accommodate so that everyone um, can have their styles best met um, ideally as possible. And I know Michelle pointed out another point you had made earlier about the paid wellness hour and um, for self-care. And I think that's also so crucial um, and a great practice that you guys are doing. Um, and I see Michelle also, Zoom fatigue is a very real thing. So taking a break from meetings now and then is important too. And I don't know, I've definitely seen a lot of uptick in articles right now about Zoom fatigue and it is so real. And um, so appreciate all of you being right now in this um, WebEx meeting um, where we're discussing this a little bit deeper because it is, it's tough and having that time to take a break is so important. And when you feel like your organization um, is respecting that and creating that space for you um, is empowering and feels good. So thank you for sharing all of that. And so I don't know, we have about six minutes left. And so I wanna make space if there's anyone else who wants to um, share anything or um, go a little bit deep, deeper into um, this topic today on workforces. Um, so I'll leave some time if anyone wants to come off with mute or, um, you know, if anyone has a question to the group, please feel free to come off of mute and ask it or type it into the chat box. So um, I'll give you guys some time if you want to add anything in, if there's anything you'd like to talk about more in detail today. And again, if you have any issues coming off of mute, just uh, raise your hand. Uh, Ola will be able to help make sure that you can speak. If not, then um, use the chat box. Um, we'd love to hear from you. And so we see Natalia is following a follow-up question here. Follow-up question on virtual opportunities for desk side chats and Zoom fatigue. How do you engage and motivate staff to participate? And so I know Michelle and Brittany, you guys have both um, thought a lot about this. And so I'd love to hear from either of you or anyone else on the line, um, if you can um, help answer Natalia's question. I don't know if Michelle, would you like to start? Do you have any insights from your experiences? Um, I know when you're training. Yeah, um, I mean, I've definitely seen organizations use alternative forms of communication that aren't um, necessarily like things like you have um, chat apps like Slack and others that um, I know the schools that we're working with in Boston have used a lot of um, kind of chat apps to communicate with their families and with each other as the staff is spread out. So to kind of minimize the number of meetings that they have to attend, I think, you know, um, like if you have longer meetings that are taking place and especially during trainings that might be longer chunks of time, um, having breaks or spreading that out, trying to do them in smaller, you know, maybe one to two hours and then you're having a nice break in between where people can actually go outside or, you know, enjoy their 
uh, enjoy a walk or something like that to just get out in fresh air and um, not be in front of the computer for like four hours straight. Um, yeah, but other or just making some um, phone call options. I know we, we all like to see each other's face, but like people can chat can if they can be on the phone, then they can be you know, outside or taking a walk or doing something for their wellness while also in that meeting, if they don't have to be in front of the computer during that meeting. Um, but other than that, I haven't come across um, a real great solution. Thanks for sharing that. I know I definitely am a fan of trying to walk and talk as much as I possibly can. Um, and so I think that's also a great idea when possible. And I know that's not an option for everyone. Um, but like Michelle said, that engagement and motivation piece um, with Zoom fatigue is, is real. And so um, if anyone has any resources or ideas on how to best counter that, please you know, submit them through the chat. Um, we do have two minutes left. So thank you so much for that um, question, Natalia. I hope that helped a little. Um, and so we have one last question. And, um, and then we will wrap it up. And so, you know, when we think about, you know, our communities right now and responding to COVID, um, the question we have for you is, do you feel your, my organization is collaborating with community partners to ensure patients still have access to resources during COVID-19? And so, um, you know, this isn't, you know, we normally are collaborating, um, you know, as much as we possibly can. And so, especially right now during COVID, when we see that, you know, there's such a high demand for resources right now, that collabor collaboration piece is key. And so, um, this poll is in the bottom right hand of your corner. And so, if you can just quickly agree or disagree that you're collaborating to make sure that people still have access to resources they need uh, right now during COVID. And so, you've got about 20 seconds left. Um, to agree or disagree that that collaboration piece is happening um, with community partners. And um, you'll see why in a short second. Um, so we have a few seconds left. And the response of our poll is 100% collaboration is happening. And so our next network forum series is all about uh, community partnerships and how essential that collaboration piece is right now and knowing that there's a lot of barriers. And so tune in um, for our next one. You'll get an email about that soon um, and you can register online. Um, there's one last poll that's popping up just a scale of one to 10. How likely are you to recommend this webinar to a colleague? If you can quickly fill that out before logging off, We'd very much appreciate it. Thank you so much to everyone um, who showed up today and participated in the discussion, um, and to Keely um, and Michelle who um, provided some insight on their projects. Um, we hope that you guys got a lot out of it, and uh, stay tuned for more information on the next network forum. So again, fill out this poll before you sign off, and then thank you for joining today, everyone.